Well, this morning we're going to continue our series on encounters with Jesus, which is a follow-up to our discipleship, um, our, our evangelism course. So this is the next encounter that we're going to look at, and it is taken from Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 13. And this is the encounter with his centurion. Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralysed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and this that one, come, and he comes. I say, say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, and will take their place at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. May God have his blessing to the reading of his word. Please pause while my technology catches up with me. Sorry about that. Microsoft have done an update since causing Anyway, this is just one of many examples in the Bible where Jesus goes about doing good. And he did it in many ways, didn't he? For example, he healed. The blind, the lame, paralyzed, bleeding, the leper, as we heard a few weeks ago. He raised people from the dead. He fed the hungry, he made wine, he befriended people, he grieved with people. He corrected injustice and judgment. <coughs> but he did something else that we overlook all the time when we consider all the good things that he did. And that is, he talked with people. But he not only talked to people, but he also talked to all kinds of people. For example, if the Lord was here today physically and came through that door, he would take those loving eyes of his and look at each of us individually, not collectively. He would share a smile with each of us. He would touch us with his hands and comfort those in their sadness, encourage those who are struggling. He would listen to us. And he would laugh at our funny stories. He would do this because the Lord loves people. And many times in God's word, he would talk with someone that others looked upon, looked down upon. Reminds me of the sketch we saw on Tuesday. Many times in God's word, he would talk with others that others would look down upon. Remember the woman at the well. It was not only a woman of the night of, of ill repute, but also from a Samaritan village. A nation of people who were bitter enemies with the Jews for hundreds of years, like we heard last week. The Lord laid his reputation on the line to talk to her. Why? Because the Bible tells us he did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Lord loves people. And the more we become like him, the more we will love people too. And when we become Christ-like, we will not just love some people, we will love all people. Last Sunday I was speaking about loving our enemies and how hard that can be. But we will not just love one race of people, we will love all races of people. We will not just socialise with some people, we will socialise with all types of people. We will not just talk to some people, we will talk to all kinds of people. We will not just help some people, we will help all people. 
That's what Christ is like. Jesus was frequently seen talking to Roman soldiers, small children, shady ladies, people of other religions and people of other colours. And the more we become like Christ, the more we will love people the same way that he did. And the reason we see people today who do not do these things is because they are not like Christ. They fail to live up to the teachings of the Saviour that they profess. So let's look at this event through the eyes of the centurion. Now the centurion was an officer in the Roman army and he was in charge of 100 soldiers originally, hence the cent centurion, although that was reduced to 80 by about 100 BC apparently. And he was used to carrying out the orders of the primus pilus, which was his superior officer. And in turn, he would give orders to his soldiers under his command. So when he came to Jesus, he knew what authority was all about. For I myself am a man under authority, the soldiers unto me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. He would have known about Jesus' ministry by the excitement with the town of Capernaum, as it spread that Jesus was coming to town. Because his, Jesus' reputation had preceded him. So when the centurion heard that Jesus was coming, he was an intent on getting some help for his sick servant. The centurion cared for his servant. He had compassion. He knew he was suffering and that he needed healing. But rather than send word to have Jesus healing, and it's interesting here because Luke, who recounts this story, actually says he sent elders, Jewish elders, to Jesus. Matthew tells us he went to see himself, Jesus. Now why is that important to us this morning? You see, under Roman occupation, it was not the dumb thing for a Roman officer to request something of a Jew. He would normally probably just demand it or take it. But here we have a centurion with rank and status going himself, spending the time and the energy to seek out Jesus. And when he gets to Jesus, we have this interesting dialogue. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralysed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? And the centurion said, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but to say the word, and my servant will be healed. The centurion was probably aware of the Jewish law that forbade a Jew from entering a non-Jewish home, a Gentile home, as it would make the Jew ceremonially unclean. Also, he probably felt unworthy because he knew Jesus to be a holy man. The, Jerusalem also, uh, the centurion also knew that if he simply asked Jesus to speak the words, it would be done. He had faith in Jesus' authority. But notice that Jesus did not categorise people as we often do. To him there are no social classes, no caste system. To him there is no religious hierarchy. To him there is no age discrimination. There is no gender discrimination. There is no colour or race discrimination. Jesus loves everyone. To him, everyone has his complete and undivided attention. To him, everyone has his love, acceptance and forgiveness. And this encounter with this Roman centurion was no different. Jesus didn't see a Roman officer in his uniform and remember that Israel was under Roman occupation. And a lot of folk hated that fact. But Jesus saw someone coming to him who had a need for a sick servant. And when the Lord cast his loving eyes upon that centurion, he saw a man who needed some help. You know how quick we are to look at somebody and judge them instantly. I remember one evening after a long day's time, a friend and I had flown down to Land's End and back. It took us all day. 
And Lewis and I decided to drop into the local village pub for a refreshing beverage on the way home before I went home to camp. And when we got there, the car park was full of motorbikes and the pub was full of house angels. They were there for the annual bulldog bash at the airfield uh, taking place that weekend. And Lewis and I just gave each other a quick look and we thought, well, we're here, so we might as well. But we were very cautious. We gingerly made our way to the bar to order our drinks and trying not to bump into anyone of those long-haired, unshaven, studded, leather-wearing brutes in case we spilled their drinks and caused the fight. So we waited extremely patiently uh, and for most of them to get their drinks. Uh, they must have been there since opening time. We didn't get there until seven at night. And Lewis and I carefully made our way out to the beer garden to enjoy the warmth and the sunset of this lovely July evening. Well, we almost got to the only empty table in the beer garden when Lewis tripped on a bench leg and lost balance. And in what seemed to be a juggling act in a circus performance, Lewis managed to catch most of his pint of beer in the glass, but some spilt down the arm of this huge giant of Hell's Angels. The table went silent. The whole garden fell silent a few seconds later. And the giant slowly stood up and looked down on Lewis as he reached into his pocket to get out his flint knife. No, it was a handkerchief. And said, Are you okay, mate? as he wiped down his arm. Lewis apologised profusely, offering to buy him another drink. But Ken said, No worries, mate, I've got a fresh one here, as he introduced himself. Lesson learned. Don't judge a book by its cover. And it's a good thing that most of us don't serve as magistrates in a magistrate's court, isn't it? Because we may let our prejudices dictate our judgment. We pigeonhole people. We store them away in categorised boxes. But thankfully, the Lord never store put people away in the boxes that we put them in. Jesus gave people a chance. Jesus gave, gave people the time of day. Jesus had conversations with all types of people who probably would not talk to, we would not talk to. So do we give the time and the chance for people to talk to us? And I'm not just talking about the people we like and share the same interests. What about those that others don't listen to or won't listen to? Do we listen to what they have to say? The centurion didn't come for his own need of healing. He came to Jesus for the needs of his sick servant. He made time for people in his life. And he took time to meet their needs. Now as a centurion, he probably had access to Roman healers. And we're not told whether he went to them or not, but we are told that the centurion knew that if he asked Jesus, his servant would be healed. Now Jesus could tell that the centurion had faith. He knew that it was a difficult thing for a Roman officer to approach a Jew and ask him for something. As the centurion said, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. And then Jesus said to the people around him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Look at this verse carefully. Matthew states that Jesus does not just say he had faith. The Lord Jesus said this man had great faith. And then Jesus says to Centurion, Go, let it be done as you said, as you believed it would. And the servant was healed at that moment. I'm sure that we would all love to have what the Bible describes as great faith. So what is this great faith then? If Jesus said that that centurion had it, then I suspect that the answer to our question is found in what he said to Jesus in verses 8 and 9. 
Lord, I do not deserve to have you under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, the soldiers under me. I tell this one, go and he goes, and that one to come and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. What you see here in the heart of this Roman soldier is what Jesus called great faith. And the first thing is that he acknowledged that he deserved nothing. He was humble before the Lord. And again, this may have been because he was aware of the Jewish law about Gentile homes, but it also may be that he recognised Jesus for who he was. And as a Roman, he knew he didn't deserve anything from Jesus. He recognised the grace of Jesus. He didn't deserve it, but Jesus would give it anyway. We don't deserve salvation, but Jesus gives it to us. And the second thing which this centurion recognised as he sub submitted to Jesus was Jesus' authority. We recognise the authority of getting the job done if he, if he so chooses. Look again when he said in verse 8, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. We accept the fact that God knows what he is doing and we accept the fact that he possesses the power to do as he wishes. We accept the fact that he knows what is best and whatever he chooses to do is fine with us. Faith is trusting the voice of God when he speaks. Now you've probably heard me say that about this story of a battleship on an exercise at sea one dark night in bad weather. And the captain was on the bridge. It was foggy and it was dark and the lookout spotted a light ahead. And the captain asked if it was steady or moving. The lookout replied, the light was steady, meaning that they were on a direct collision course with that light. The captain ordered the signalman to signal the view of the vessel, change your course 20 degrees to starboard. We are on a collision course. The signal came back. Advise you change your course 20 degrees starboard. The captain signaled back, tell him, I am the captain of a battleship, change your course 20 degrees to starboard. Back came the signal, I am a lighthouse keeper, your call. <laughs> the encounter of the centurion and Jesus tells us a number of things. Firstly, Jesus loves everyone. And if we want to be more like Jesus, we must do the same. Secondly, he meets the care of those in need. No matter what their background, no matter what their circumstances. If we want to be more like Jesus, we need to do the same. Thirdly, anyone can approach him in faith and receive from him. And our job is to help anyone do the same. And finally, Jesus has the power to make changes, even in our lives, if we let him. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for the encounter of the centurion with Jesus. Well, there is so much to learn from that particular encounter. But I pray, Lord, that we would learn to love as the priority. <coughs> Lord, it can be difficult to love people that aren't from your same background or have the same values, even the moral values. But Lord, that's what you call us to do. We know that love can break down many barriers. And we need to understand that it is your love, Lord, not ours, that does that. So Lord, will you draw us closer to yourself this morning as we receive your unconditional love, 
may it overflow from us to those around us. Those people that we encounter this week who have need, whether it is through grief, healing, hurt, going through difficult times, perhaps loneliness. Lord, may we respond with your love and bring them to you in prayer. And if they have needs in practical ways, Lord, may we help. Provide us with the resources so we can be your ambassadors, your hands, your feet. Lord, take us and use us this week for your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, since as members of one body we are called to peace. May the message of Christ dwell among us richly, as we teach and admonish one another, with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. And whatever we do, whether in word or deed, let us do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father, through him. Amen. 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 Shall we say it for us? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit,